Bill, talk a little bit about upper cervical spine injuries this morning. So this is a lady that I took care of. Um, she was in a motor vehicle accident. She was pregnant. She had an emergency section. This is an axial view through C1, C2. And you can see there's increased ADI greater than three millimeters. There's also an avulsion fracture off the medial aspect of the C1 ring. These are sagittal views of the CT scan. There's an avulsion fracture off the inferior ring of C1. Some widening posteriorly between C1, C2, and you can see the C1, C2 joint is in kyphosis. Um, this is the coronal view. And there's another avulsion fracture off the occipital condyle. So any of these injuries individually may be stable, you know, except for the increased ADI, but at the constellation, they're not stable. So this is the MRI scan, shows a lot of fluid signal anteriorly between Clactus and C3, C4. Um, some disruption of the apical ligament, tectorial membrane. So this is a version of an OC1 dissociation. Um, so those are unstable injuries and have to be went in octopus to the posterior fusion. So you can think of the octopus to C2 as, a, as one complex. Um, really, there's a, there's a sling of ligaments that connects the clivus to the odontoid um, apical ligament and the end of the ALL and the uh, alien ligaments. Um, so, a third of these injuries just have occipital condyle fractures. Um, uh, type 1 are impacted in commonality, can be treated in a cervical collar. Uh, type 2 extended to the base of the skull, it can also be treated in a cervical collar. Um, but when you have an avulsion of the ligaments, those can be potentially unstable, whether the, it's the apical ligament or the alar ligaments. Um, so these need to be reduced urgently and they can even um, get worse in the hospital. A lot of times um, it's not recognized initially and when they come in um, uh, there's usually plenty of other stuff to do including ATLS. You know a lot of these patients are obtunded and so they eventually need surgery but they need to, may need to be temporized with a halo. So these are the normal measurements. Um, the best rule to kind of remember is the rule of 12, which says between the distance between the Bayesian to the odontoid should be less than 12. And then if you put a line along the posterior aspect of the dens, the distance between that and the Bayesian should be less than 12. Um, it's a little bit easier to find these landmarks on an x-ray than doing the powers ratio, which is a ratio of the uh, Bayesian to the posterior arch over the anterior arch to the opposite. Um, and this is uh, not valid in posterior dislocations. So I'll, over 40% over of these patients have a neurologic decline in, um, in the hospital, even if they come in um, intact. And Seattle, um, Bella Barber in Seattle did a good study. Oftentimes you can't, sometimes you can't tell if they have a true OC1 dissociation. So I've had to do this a couple of times where I've taken them to the operating room and, and you do a gentle traction test to see if they actually widen or not. And if they don't, then you can treat them in a collar. If they do, then obviously they need surgery. Um, so your occipital in instrumentation, uh, not something that you do every day, um, but the thickest part of the bone is the inion just below the, uh, you want the plate to sit just below the inion or the external occipital protuberance. It's also where the confluence of sinus is. So uh, typically, you know, you used to always measure the screws and they're usually eight to 12 millimeters. Um, and you can get, you know, a rush of blood if you get into the sinus or you can even get a CSF leak. If you do, then you just put in, put in the screw and that tamponades, you just have to be careful when you drill. Um, you want to measure your alignment. Um, alignment along the base of the skull from the clivus to the posterior part of the uh, occiput and along the C23 disc should be about 45 degrees and um, 
this is not very forgiving, so you want to make sure that they're positioned appropriately um, before you start. Um, so this is another uh, case. This is a 62-year-old gentleman who's involved in a motor vehicle accident. Um, you can see he has a C2 odontoid uh, fracture. This could be an acute on chronic injury. He may have had a fracture before. Uh, this is an axial through the C1 ring, and he also has a uh, burst or Jefferson type fracture of the C1 ring. You can see a fracture anteriorly and then through transverse foramen laterally. Um, this is a coronal view uh, showing a fracture through the base of the dens. And this is the MRI scan. You can see some anterior fluid, um, but likely there is also a chronic uh, injury. Um, or a chronic non-union, probably had odontoid fracture previously. So treatments include collar, a halo, um, or surgery. Um, this patient ended up eventually getting an odontoid screw. So Jefferson fractures or C1 ring fractures, um, you know, the study that everybody quotes um, is seven millimeters of overhang of the C1 lateral masses over C2. Now that was a study that was a cadaver study um, where they basically pulled apart C1 rings to see um, how much, um, how long, how much displacement you needed before the transverse ligament ruptured. Um, it wasn't a clinical study. So Heller then did a clinical study and patients even with greater than seven millimeters of overhang uh, did well um, in either a collar or a halo. So not Every patient that has a over seven millimeters of distraction that definitely needs surgery. Now, if the ADI or the atlantodense interval is widened and the rupture of the transverse ligament, then likely they'll need surgery. Um, and most patients that have C1 fractures also have other cervical fractures, so you need to make sure you look for the other injuries. Um, C1, C2 rotatory subluxation is. Uh, uh, mostly prevalent in kids. If there's an ADI greater than three to five millimeters, then uh, they usually require traction uh, for reduction and then surgery for posterior fusion. So dontoid fractures can be classified as type one, which is just the tip where the apical ligament inserts, uh, base of the dens, uh, which is uh, one that has a higher risk of non-union anywhere from 15 to 40 percent, and then fractures that go into the C2 body. Um, typically, these can be treated in a collar. If they're displaced, then they may need to be temporized in a halo or treated in a halo. So this is another case, a 28-year-old gentleman with PTSD, also involved in a motor vehicle accident, had multiple other injuries, open fractures, ulnar nerve injury. Um, it has this axial view through the base of C2, and you can see this sagittal uh, split. Um, these are the sagittal and coronal views, and it's kind of an, a unique fracture. This is more of a C2 body fracture. There's another classification of C2 body fractures. Uh, and you can see the fracture line goes through the base and up into the left C1, C2 articulation. Um, from the lateral view, it seems to be an incomplete fracture. It doesn't really go through the entire base of the dens. Um, so he underwent treatment of his other injuries, was placed in a cervical collar, and um, this fracture, you know, on first look, looks like it should be stable. Um, the fracture is not really displaced. It's, not, it's kind of an incomplete fracture. Um, so once his other injuries were treated, I got upright imaging on him, and he started to rotate and started to displace. And you can see on the axial view, the left side's displacing, and the C1, C2 facet is displacing. Um, so treatment options for him now, you could, you know, certainly he's failing a cervical collar. Um, you know, it's a C2 body fracture, so it should heal. It has a large surface area. Um, so I treated him in a halo. Um, so halos were first developed for to take care of pilots in World War II. Um, actually out here, Perry and Nickel 
Rancho Los Amigos used it to treat polio patients. Um, so halos are not completely rigid devices. I did not know um, that. Still, what's that? That's pretty, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. That yeah, that's, yeah, it's an interesting history when it first kind of started. Um, so it's not a rigid device. Um, it's you know, it allows some motion, so you have to be careful when you're treating patients. It's, you know, not like surgery where, you know, hopefully they're stable once you treat them. Um, when patients are supine, you know, the cervical spine and the fractures tend to distract some, and then when they're sitting and staying, they tend to compress. So you want patients that are being treated in a halo to be somewhat upright, you know, moving around and even maybe sleeping in a recumbent area, in a recumbent position. Um there's the most motion up at the occiput um, C1, um, and then and then below C2. So it's very good for treating upper cervical injuries, but not great for treating subaxial spine injuries. Um, so these are um, this is a study looking at upright and supine X-rays, and you know they had anywhere from one to two millimeters of translation at seven millimeters of angulation, but typically did not cause any treatment failure. It was enough stability to allow the fractures to heal. Um, it does restrict 75% of C1, C2 uh, motion, so it's very good for upper cervical injuries. And most patients, will they, once they get used to it, can do most of their ADLs. Um, but you do want to check upright and supine x-rays once they're in the halo to make sure you're not having excessive motion. Um, so good indications are potentially occipital condyle fractures, um, to temporize OC1 injuries, but certainly not for a definitive treatment. Uh, C1, C2 fractures, including odontoid fractures, hangman's fractures, and uh, subaxial cervical spine injuries are not a great indication for halos. So there's some relative contra contraindications, obviously elderly patients, morbidly obese patients, you know, can't fit into a halo, and patients that have neurologic injury, you're not gonna tolerate a halo. Um, as with anything, there's um, complications, pin site infections, loosening. Um, the halo can migrate um, off. You may have to change your um, your pins. Um, you want to check them, you know, every couple of weeks to make sure they're stable. And you want to make sure your fracture is stable too and is not displaced. So this is a meta-analysis of treatment of upper cervical injuries and, you know, uh, 90 to 100 percent of upper cervical injuries will heal in a halo. Um, you know, the one we always talk about is type two odontoid fractures, and um, you know the non-union rate can be anywhere from 15 to 40 percent, depending on the study that you look at. So it's good for upper injury, upper cervical injuries, but you make sure, you have to make sure that you watch it closely. Um, when you're uh, just as a review, when you're applying a halo. Um, you want to be in the upper outer quadrant above the eyelid to avoid the supraorbital supratrochlear nerves about a centimeter above the eyelid. Then make sure they close their eyes and make sure that they're swallowing okay um, uh, because they're going to be in it for anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks. So uh, surgical options for uh, odontoid fractures. An anterior odontoid screw. There's good uh, healing. Um, it does preserve motion, which is nice. Um, contraindications is obviously if you have a ligament injury, if they have a big barrel chest, or if they're osteoporotic. Um, you know, the study out of Utah talks about using two screws for elderly patients. It's usually I found it difficult to even get one screw in a lot of times, so I'm not sure there's much room in the odontoid for two screws. Uh, because of the dissection, they can still have you know, significant dysphagia. Um, so a reverse oblique fracture, so a fracture line that goes, you know, perpendicular to the way the screw is going to go is, is great for a screw, but if it goes the opposite way, the screw is not going to really capture it and it's going to kind of slide and shorten, so those are not great. Uh, that's not a great type of fracture for an, for an anterior screw. Um, posterior C1, C2 wiring, you know, historically it was done, I mean, now we have you know, better methods of fixation. Uh, posterior wiring resi resisted flexion, but did not resist extension and intact C1 ring, which is not always the case. 
transarticular screws. Um, you know, many people don't do them anymore, um, but they are still a good fixation method. Um, you only need two screws, so um, the construct cost is less. Uh, you need to do have to get the fracture reduced prior to putting in the screws, which you don't have to do if you do uh, uh, C1 articular mass screws and bar screws. Um, and and you have to make sure the pars, the most important thing is that the pars, the area here just above the vertebral artery is at least four millimeters thick. Um, if it's not, then it's not going to be thick enough to, to take a screw. And the anatomy at C1, C2 is very variable. So for anybody, for any patient that you're doing a C1, C2 articulate, C1, C2 fixation on, you need to look and see the thickness of the pars and also the thickness of the pedicle because sometimes one is... Um, uh, less robust than the other, and sometimes one vertebral foramen is much bigger than the other. Uh, and then C1 lateral mass and C2 pedicle parsers, which is what most people do nowadays, first described by Goyle, Goyle uh, and, then, and then subsequently described by Harms. Um, you have to make sure that you uh, preserve uh, the venous plexus. Well, not really preserve it, but just when you're dissecting under C1, there's always a venous plexus there, so there's some tricks to, you know, keep it from bleeding as much. Retract the C2 nerve root. Um, when they first described it, they would resect the C2 nerve root, so you get a patch of numbness in the back of the skull. Um, but nowadays, most of the time, you don't need to resect the C2 nerve root. Um, you can place your screws, and then you can, you know, adjust the head and reduce the fracture and, and the alignment, so it makes it a little bit easier than um, to do that than doing uh, transarticular screws where it has to be reduced beforehand. And then you still need to uh, figure out your bone grafting and fixation for the bone grafting because the screws obviously are your stability, but you still need to bone graft uh, that area. Um, if the pedicle, um, the pars are too small, you can do C2 laminar screws. Um, and this is a diagram of it uh, to make sure one starts um, more proximal, one starts a little distal. You need to find the medial edge of the of the pars, and that'll make sure that the screw is not too medial or too lateral. You should be able to see laterally. Um, and that's also the uh, important point, the important area to find when you're starting your uh, before you're putting in pars screws, as long as and pedicle screws, because as long as you're um, you can see medially, then you can make sure the screw doesn't go into the canal. And the pars is really this area here between the superior articular process and the inferior articular process, whereas the pedicle is really this area up here connecting the posterior um, bone to the anterior body. Um, and so the, the original description for the C1, C2 screws was to use uh, pedicle screws, but it's a fairly steep uh, lateral to medial angle, so it's difficult to often get the screws in or you need a uh, larger dissection. So there's lots of studies that have been done looking at halos and surgery for C2 fractures. Um, they all have a high morbidity mortality rate, so this is a study looking at halos. 50% of people got a pneumonia. 20% um, uh, of patients had a cardiac respiratory arrest, so it's not, um, these are bad injuries in elderly patients. Um, you know, none of these studies are, are great. This study didn't uh, delineate the different fracture types. Um, a third of the patients that, that uh, um, died were on the floor. So one of the recommendations they did make is if you do put somebody in a halo, then um, it's probably a good idea to put a swallow eval um, uh, once they go up to the floor. Because um, even in younger patients, they can some, have some swallowing difficulty. Um, type two and type three um, fra uh, fractures, um, they still had a high rate of major complications, whether they were the HALO or not. Um, the HALO uh, patients had a higher rate of complications, but had the same limitations as the last study. Um, this is a retrospective study. You know, patients still healed, 85% of patients healed, but there was still a 15 to 20% rate of complications. Um, and when patients get a non-union, about 
60 to 70 percent of them are asymptomatic. Um, the risk factors that you want to look for, obviously, older age, if they're osteoporotic, um, but the other ones, if they're displaced, if there's greater than five millimeters of displacement, you start the treatment late, um, or they have any posterior displacement, they're a higher risk of not healing. Um, and Vicaro did a study looking at patients um, after being put into a, a halo and even a, in a cervical collar. Um, at two weeks, they took supine and standing x-rays, and if there was you know, greater than five, five degrees of angulation and greater than um, uh, two to three millimeters of displacement, um, they had a higher risk of treatment failure, so you can also convert them early if you follow their x-rays and make sure that they're uh, not displacing early. Um, anterior screws still have a high complication rate. Uh, Non-union rate is about 10 to 12 percent. You know, complication rate 20 to 40 percent, 10 percent in mortality rate, and there's a high dysphagia rate from anterior screws. And this is a study looking at C1, C2 posterior uh, fusion. It's a little bit older study, but they still had a you know a lower non-union rate, but 5 percent, and uh, um, misplaced screws and then 20 to 40 percent mortality rate probably a little bit high compared to more recent studies uh, that have been reported but even with the c1 c2 fusion um, there's still a high morbidity mortality rate uh, this is a review in the journal of trauma um, looking at non-operative and operative uh, treatments for these fractures uh, and their conclusion was that uh, they had similar similar complication and mortality rates. Um, the non-operative treatment, non-operative group obviously stayed, obviously stayed in the hospital stays um, and were less days on a ventilator. Um, but um, there's a more recent study looking at outcomes, and the surgically treated group had uh, slightly better outcomes than the non-operative treated group. So overall, it's a you know odontoid fractures seems somewhat benign but it's a devastating injury for older patients somewhat like hip fractures no, no matter what you do there's a high morbidity and mortality rate um, you do want to get patients moving as soon as possible and so sometimes that means doing a c1 c2 posterior fusion um, uh, but you need to watch them carefully um, and try to treat them sooner rather than later um, the longer they stay in the hospital and longer before they get treatment the higher likely they stay on the vent longer. So this is a, uh, this is a lady that I took care of um, who got hit by a car. She had multiple other injuries. She also had a thoracic fracture, which uh, resulted in paraplegia. Uh, she's a Jehovah's Witness, and she's somewhat obese. Not much, not much of a neck there. Um, so she's got a hangman's fractures or fractures through the C2 pars. Um, you can see it just below the transverse foramen is. On the MRI scan, not a lot of signal. There's some signal anteriorly between clivus and C3. There's a little tear in the posterior, in the PLL, uh, the posterior disc space. And with her obesity, she's not really a candidate for a halo. So um, so she had a C2, C3 posterior fusion. And there's different ways to do that. Nowadays, most of the time, we use, uh, you know, uh, uh, screws with tulips on it with rods. Um, you can also do the old school method. You can actually use lag screws um, to lag that fracture together. Um, and if you're, you know, treating um, a hangman's fracture, uh, because the fracture goes through the pars, if you're going to put screws at C2, you really have to put in pedicle screws. So you can see here that uh, these screws kind of go through the pedicle and then uh, vertebral arteries laterally, and then they need to go into the body to actually lag that fracture together. Um, you can also do uh, C2 osteosynthesis. Um, so in a young person, that's a motion-preserving operation. And you can lag that fracture together to, to heal as opposed to fusing a segment. And that has a good uh, union rate. So type 1's minimal displacement, type 2's uh, greater than 3 millimeters displacement. You can often reduce them and treat them in a uh, 
in a halo. Uh, type 2A are flexion, distraction, injury. So there's no, dis there's no translation, but there's angulation of the fracture. So you, know, you want to be careful with those ones. You don't want to put them in traction because they'll just distract more and they can get a spinal cord injury. Um, uh, but you can, you can reduce them and treat them in a halo as long as you reduce them in extension. And then uh, type threes with a facet dislocation uh, need surgery. And then there's an atypical uh, hangman's fracture that was described by Eismont. Um, so instead of the fracture going through the pars, it actually goes through the posterior body and through the facet joint. And on the sagittal view, you see this posterior aspect of the C2 body here. Um, so those have a higher risk of neurologic injury because as the fracture displaced, that fragment uh, tends to push on the spinal cord. So you have to be careful with these and make sure that they're um, reduced um, and that they don't get further displacement while they're waiting, hanging out in the hospital waiting for surgery. All right. Questions? No, really good, Manish. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Manish. Great talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you think uh, I, I got? I have a question for you. Um, how uh, how much do you think our practice for upper cervical trauma is evolving? I, I feel like. Since you and I trained, it's been a little bit more static. If there's not been any real um, epiphanies or you know dramatic changes in how we manage these things, is that your sense? Yeah, my sense would be the same. I don't think things have changed a whole lot. I mean, I think they've done you know some more outcome studies, but in terms of like surgical treatment, you know, non-operative treatments, I don't think it's changed a whole lot. Um, I think the you know, kind of the big change when you and I were training was that, uh, you know, everybody was getting a CT scan all of a sudden. So, you know, diagnosing it a lot more than they were previously. Uh, you know, now that's pretty standard practice, obviously. 